You are watching the last round of horror show. I am Frank, and with me this time we have Ray McGuff. Hello. And as always on this version of the show, we have Elliot Passantino. Hello. And Lisa Marie Luminet. Hello, hello. Our special guest this time is Jay from Jay vs. Horror. You can check out the group on Facebook. You can check out the YouTube channel on YouTube. Uh, how you doing, Jay? I'm doing good. I hope all the horror fans out there are doing great tonight. Yeah. What are you doing, Elliot? I'm like Renfield and Jacko right now. I didn't know if you were doing editing points for me or what. No, well, maybe. (laughs) I got, yeah, literally chasing this fly around. (laughs) Elliot's spazzing out again. Getting crazy. He's he's had too many martinis. I know. I'm on my first. (laughs) What you go with there? Is that a gin martini or is that a... Uh, This actually, it's a a Grey Goose martini. Hey, top shelf. (laughs) There he goes. All right. Well, what do you have for us this time, Elliot? Where are we going? Um, Well, I guess because we... uh, Sorry. (laughs) Literally, I'm like in Renfield Asylum over Carpac (laughs) Avenue. Uh... I guess because we, I mean, we kept coming back and forth the last couple of times with the kind of like the whole timeline with Dracula and, uh, you know, the gestation and origins of the novel and and, the, and and how it was made into a movie. So I guess like, uh, you know, I guess getting back into just a quick recap, we talked a little bit, we talked a lot about Bram Stoker writing it and, uh, you know, how he came up with all these characters in the novel and uh you know since then i've actually read more stuff <laughs> and uh so it's interesting to find out more about just like the backstory of the people in his life that created these characters in the novel that would become iconic characters on you know stage and on the silver screen so uh, like i mentioned a little bit henry irving he was uh his boss and basically his like best buddy that he met in the 1870s uh, while living in Dublin and going to Trinity College. And uh, Henry Irving was this huge, huge star all across um, England, the UK, who as an actor, director, uh, and, and even writer, he performed Faust, uh, starring as Mephistopheles. And wow. he did the productions of Hamlet and, and Macbeth, starring as the leaning man in those. And basically by the 1870s, as Stoker was writing all these, uh, his first horror novels and horror stories, like Under the Sunset and these others, he became friends with this man that he looked up to a lot. And uh, it was really come the end of the um, 1870s is where he goes to work for Henry Irving, this famous actor, director, there he is, uh, at, at the Elysium Theater in London. So uh, you can see looking at the real life photographs of Henry Irving, there is that interesting you know, similarity to the descriptions of Dracula in the book And as we see on, you know, screen for the next hundred years or so. Uh, So Henry Irving, again, is like, you know, it's a very, very similar um, relationship uh, between Dracula and Renfield, so to speak, is what Irving and uh, Bram Stoker have really with Stoker more on the Renfield uh, part of things. And uh, basically most of, um, you know, his life uh, from the 1880s into the 20th century is really, um, you know, Bram Stoker being, you know, Henry Irving's everything, every man and, and financier running, uh, you know, checks and everything for the Lyceum, taking care of Henry Irving's affairs. And uh, Ellen Terry is also this world renowned, very beautiful actress, British actress, who is, uh, you know, there's all these thoughts uh, today that, you know, she basically might have been having an affair with Henry Irving. And definitely, you know, Bram Stoker was very, very fond of her. So it's, again, a little bit of that Jonathan Harker. Uh, and Mina and Dracula kind of triangle where, you know, this beautiful woman is kind of like being, you know, caught between these two men that have a very powerful place in her life. And uh, so it's all these intrigue and drama in real life that uh, kind of goes into him writing Dracula. And, um, you know, his brother, I think we talked a little bit before, you know, it's his brother, Bram's brother, that actually had gone away to war at some point, you know, in the 1800s. And he's the one that actually uh, came across Transylvania and Romania. And it's Bram Stoker's brother that told him about Romania and Transylvania and this, you know, the story of this Wallachian prince. And, uh, you know, it's his brother that draws in, um, you know, these ideas about this Prince Vlad Tepish, Vlad Vlad Dracula. And uh, it's between all this happening as he's writing this in the early 1890s, 
I got to look up his name because it's such a crazy name. <laughs> but um, he meets uh, this world-renowned um, traveler that is like a real-life, um, basically like a doctor. And uh, yeah, this, he reached this real-life archaeologist, doctor, scientist who's traveled the world and has actually been to Romania. And his name is Arminius Vanbury. And Arminius Vanbury is actually the real-life Van Helsing. And it's because he meets Arminius Vanbury one night backstage at the Lyceum uh, as a guest to Henry Irving in Henry Irving's like private suite, which is filled with all this brandy and, and liquor and food. Uh, Arminius Vanbury is the one that tells them really about Vlad Tepish and the real Prince Dracula. And uh, because Arminius Vanbury is so like, you know, overwhelming of a character, uh, you know, he really does base Van Helsing, almost everything that Van Helsing is and wow. even dialogue is based on Arminius Vanbury. And uh, so it's interesting, this, again, this whole different uh, cast of characters, uh, you know, coming in and out. Oh, there it is. <laughs> coming cool. in and out of uh, the Lyceum kind of become, you know, basically the um, characters in his novel. And uh, again, as we talked about before, it's, uh, you know, published in 1897. And uh, it's published in 1897. It's not a huge success. And, uh, you know, as it goes into the 1900s is where it starts to get more success. And uh, people like H.P. Lovecraft kind of dig up the dirt to say, you know, I don't think he wrote it on his own. And it's kind of come out that another writer named Edith Miniter, she's a female writer, novelist of kind of like weird stories and who uh, actually wrote some, uh, was writing stuff with H.P. Lovecraft herself. It's kind of come out because H.P. Lovecraft's, you know, research at the time that, you know, Edith did help Bram Stoker assemble a lot of uh, you know, the story and some of the editing processes that went into making Dracula a novel. So it's, uh, you know, just some little tidbits there. And again, just bringing us up to speed, you know, I talked about Bela Lugosi before and everything, but it's interesting that, you know, Bella was someone struggling actor named Aristat Olt or uh, Bella Ferenc Desko Blasco. He's an Hungarian. He was in World War I. He had to hide under corpses to survive World War I and the gas attacks. So uh, he's really been through the ringer when he finally comes to the States, you know, in the late 1920s. And uh, we talked a little bit about F.W. Murnau, who of, of course did uh, Nosferatu, which, you know, we've all, I'm sure you guys have seen or have heard about. And, uh, you know, the famous uh, movie that Nicolas Cage produced where um, John Malkovich is, you know, and William Defoe's that you know, like a vampire playing, you know, the part. But, uh, Basically, the guy, F.W. Murnau, who did Nosferatu, you know, he did that without the rights from Florence Balcom Stoker, who was at this time, by that time, Bram Stoker's widow. So Bram Stoker wow. died, I think, in the 1915 or so. And uh, his rights and the rights to Dracula became ownership of Florence Balcom Stoker, who absolutely hated the book. She hated the book. She hated Dracula. She hated everything about it. So <laughs> um, when F.W. Murnau went and did Nosferatu, he didn't get the rights to it. You know, lawsuit happened and every copy was ordered to be burned and destroyed. And luckily, this didn't happen. But um, what F.W. Murnau kept doing was doing adaptations of books and stories without getting any approval. And uh, very strangely, in the whole Dracula vein of things, the way it all works out, that Bela Lugosi then was in another unlicensed adaptation of Dr. Uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, called The Head of Janice. And F.W. Murnau had cast him in that movie. And again, that movie was lost. But again, so Bela Lugosi had this weird kind of very strange metaphysical connection to doing this movie with this director who had just done the first unlicensed version of Dracula I really ever made, a apart from a, a very lost Hungarian film, I think, that happened before that. So he's kind of kind of got the Dracula mojo coming uh, along with him as he comes to the States in the 1920s. And it's at this time that... Uh, Actor Raymond uh, Huntley has been playing Dracula in Europe, and uh, Hamilton Dean is the first person to actually get the rights from Florence Stoker to make Dracula into a play. And Hamilton Dean has been producing and directing it uh, in London, and it's just starting to get ready to go to the States to tour when Raymond Huntley says, I've had it. I don't want to put on the cloak anymore. I don't want to do this. And uh, that's when it all comes together that Bela Lugosi takes the part of Dracula some point, I think 1926, 1927. And uh, wow. that's how Bela Lugosi gets the role. And he starts touring with Dracula 
the Hamilton Hamilton Dean stage version, the very first version of Dracula ever made. He tours with it about 261 times. He plays Count Dracula from New York to New Orleans to LA to, uh, you know, Buffalo, Syracuse even. And, uh, you know, ironically, his assistant for some of these tours, especially in New York City, is none other than a very young, struggling William Castle who will go on to be, you know, the godfather of B-movies, House of the Haunted Hill, produces Rosemary's Baby. So a little interesting thing there that William Castle is very young as he's being Bela Lugosi's assistant, you know, during Bela Lugosi's tour as Dracula. And uh, basically, it's a big success. I think Hamilton Dean basically at some point does become Dracula himself after Bela Lugosi gets tired of it. And uh, this kind of brings us up to 1930, where MGM has one Cheney, the man of a thousand faces under contract, and uh, it's trying to get one Cheney to do new jobs. Lon Cheney also has some kind of deal worked out with Universal and Carl Emily Jr. and Sr. to maybe come back to Universal. But uh, basically, Lon Cheney comes down with pneumonia and bronchial cancer and what have you. And, you know, there's all different, you know, reasons why still being debated of what really made Lon Cheney got sick and died. But he wants to become Dracula. He wants to play Dracula and he wants to reunite with Todd Browning, who had directed him in a base between eight and ten different movies. Uh, you know, including on Holy Three and London After Midnight. And so he wants to reunite with Todd Browning, who's been a big alcoholic. He's been struggling for years with alcoholism. He's kind of been booted out of the, the studio system, but now he's making a comeback. And uh, Lynn Shaney wants to play both Van Helsing and Dracula. And uh, he's actually has character designs and makeup designs, but he starts to get very, very sick. And uh, come July 1930, he's basically stalling MGM to not work, stalling Universal, but he's more interested in doing something with Universal and playing Dracula. That's what to be the role that he wants to come back to as his next project. And uh, basically he worsens as, uh, you know, the MGM switchboards are being flooded with fans from around the world who start learning that Lon Chaney's sick. And, uh, you know, switchboards flooded with people offering kidneys and organs, like anything to save Lon Chaney, who's, again, he's not just a horror star, he is one of the biggest stars in the world. And uh, finally, somewhat by August 1930, Universal's finally got the official rights from Florence Stoker. And uh, they have a Pulitzer Prize winning author write up a 32 page treatment, uh, uh, basically the first real treatment of Dracula for the screen. And uh, they're very excited to get Cheney involved. And uh, unfortunately, August 26, 1930, Len Cheney dies. And that's basically where Carl Emily Jr. and Senior go into a tailspin of what are we going to do now? Like we just lost one of the greatest stars in history, one of the greatest stars ever and uh, our star for Dracula. And uh, that's when the hunt goes on to cast anybody. And uh, they start off by casting this guy, that guy, Conrad Veidt, like we had talked about last time, uh, who played, uh, you know, the influence for the Joker and the man who laughs. And, uh, they tested everybody and they finally, someone says, hey, you know, I think it's his son, Junior, says, Dad, how about we try the guy who played Dracula 261 times? You know, <laughs> maybe this guy could be right for the part. He's already got the cape. And um, uh, Carl, I mean, okay, okay. He said, let's test them for both. I want to make Frankenstein, I want to make Dracula at the same time. Both of them are slated to start production in 1930, the, uh, the summer into the fall. And uh, he tests uh, Lugosi for Frankenstein. Carl Emily Sr. just laughs hysterically at how bad he looks. Uh, <laughs> Lugosi gets pissed and says, I was a great actor in my country. I refuse to be a scarecrow in this one. That's basically his exact <laughs> words. And uh, he's, he's just basically like, screw this. I don't need this. I'm great. And uh, finally, it comes down to negotiation that he gets to part for $500 a week. He, he says, I'm going to wear my own cape from the, the run of touring the country. Uh, no fangs. I refuse to have fangs because I'm amazing looking and I'm beautiful. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so he wants no prosthetics. And, uh, you know, there's some talks, I guess, in different books about, uh, I think, Jack Pierce, uh, the famous, you know, iconic uh, FX creator of, you know, all these great looks for, uh, you know, Frankenstein and the mummy and, and whatever. Uh, you know, I think he had ideas, but Lugosi says no way. 
And uh, Todd Browning basically directs the movie with Carl Frund as his DP. And, uh, you know, they shoot that from August 1930, I think, into November. And at the same time, uh, there's this very unknown struggling actor whose real name is William, William Henry Pratt, who is known on the stage as Boris Karloff. And uh, he's been around, he's been hustling for the last, uh, you know, 10 years of his life. And uh, he's been a, a heavy in a couple of films and, uh, you know, kind of one-liners as the bad guy. And he's a guy who in 1926, while he's walking home from the Universal lot, playing one of a thousand extras or whatever, uh, he looks to his left and he sees this guy slow down to offer him a ride and it's Lon Chaney. And wow. in 1926, Lon Chaney gives uh, Boris Karloff a ride home because I guess he recognized him around the lot. And he, he says, you know, what are you doing here? What are you after? And, uh, you know, Karloff says, you know, I really just trying to make it as an actor. And uh, Chaney says, you know, the key to success in this town is finding something that no one else can do and doing it. And he also says a quote I just found today researching uh, this book I wrote, uh, read, uh, he basically says, like, if you're going to be an actor, you got to be an actor. You can't ever give up. This is it. This is for the rest of your life. You got to do it until you make it. And, uh, you know, it's those words that really keep Carlisle going for the next couple of years until, again, the summer of 1930, as they're about the green lighting, we'll go see in Dracula. And now James Whale, who is uh, Hollywood's first out and about uh, homosexual not closet, who's very well known. This is a huge thing in 1930. And uh, he's had some success with some epics and some period pieces. And so now he's been handed the reins to make Frankenstein based on a, a John Balderston uh, draft of the uh, Mary Shelley novel and also the stage play that's been being put on since the 1800s uh, based on Mary Shelley's book. So, um, James Whale basically is tasked with casting. And again, it's the same thing. How do we find this guy to play the monster? And uh, there's different stories and I've read so many books. So there's never like a final bottom line, but it's a mixture of either his lover, William Lewis, uh, or I forget the real name, but he's either his lover saw him in a Boris Karloff doing a play in Burbank or, you know, James Whale had spotted Karloff uh, at the commissary eating one day on the universe a lot, but I think it's really a bit of both that I think his lover uh, that actually did see him in something. And uh, I know that there is some stuff from Carlos biography where Karloff, you know, he was broke and he finally got a call from his agent that, Hey, this guy wants to see you for an audition. And uh, Karloff couldn't believe it had no clue. And I think that along with, you know, Karloff meeting James whale while eating lunch one day, all kind of comes together uh, with uh Whale really seen this sympathy, this empathy and sympathy that he sees in Karloff's eyes that he, he wants that from his monster. And uh, that's what basically gets Karloff cast. Same thing, summer of 1930. And, uh, you know, Karloff gets put into makeup by Jack Pierce. And, uh, you know, they really hit, hit it off. And Pierce starts doing all these, these fantastic ideas we have today. It all comes from Pierce studying, you know, dental books and dental figures and pictures of corpses and cadavers kind of come up with this iconic, you know, box head, uh, bolt neck thing that we have today. And, uh, you know, him and Karlov hit it off really well. And, uh, you know, when he starts filming, he, he comes into his dressing room in August of 1930. And he finds out that the very dressing room that he has was Lon Chaney's in this whole time that he was on the lot. So. Wow. That's know, so very, cool. Yeah. Very, very full circle. And uh, from there again, Karlov and Lugosi, are in a very tandem path now that they're both now in these two movies, making these two movies as unknowns that are going to change their careers and their lives and actually change horror cinema as we know it. And both of them basically wrap around October, November, 1931. And, uh, you know, Karloff had the worst run of anybody up to this point, period, in the history of filmmaking, because he had to do so much hours of makeup to be Frankenstein taking out one of his bridges that he had. And uh, he's wearing these uh, like very heavy boots and uh, it throws out his back during like the fights with Dwight Fry as the hunchback. And uh, he's had a rough and it becomes actually this one day when he does the famous uh, scene where he throws the girl in the lake because the girl can't fall right. And she doesn't look like she's drowning. It just goes on and on and on. And they're all the way up in the country above uh, Universal Studios somewhere. 
and basically it becomes a 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. day, basically a 25 hour working day for Karloff. And again, this is all pre Screen Actors Guild, whatever. And it's because of that day that Karloff really starts to change, you know, studio policies and procedures for acting in general in the industry. And he goes to whatever that current version was of SAG and says, this is insane. And they cut it down to like, okay, from now on, all actors will only have a 16 hour day. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's that. And then again, you know, when he gets into doing the mummy, there's a final day there that is again, atrocious. And it's that final day in the mummy that really does inspire uh, Boris Karloff to eventually create Screen Actors Guild uh, to protect all actors. Wow, who knew that? That's amazing. <laughs> I didn't know any of that shit. So. I didn't either. <laughs> That's so that's I'm a at. little bit, but of that again, that part of history right now we're at is 1931, and those two guys are unknowns. They're both between 43 and 46, and uh, struggling their whole life. And it's that summer of 1930 changes their lives and basically changes horror film history as we know it. Starts the ball. That's incredible. Around. That's yeah. incredible. Now, okay, who starts the rivalry? Where does that start? I, I think you know there was that rivalry, like you had mentioned before, and we talked about. Um, I, I think it becomes that Karloff uh, starts getting better roles, you know, and, and Lugosi, it's just, he does Dracula. He doesn't want to do Dracula. I think it's a lot of Lugosi's ego. He's just so vain that um, it kind of becomes part of his downfall besides the morphine addiction that we see in Ed Wood. The, movie <laughs> the old morphine addiction. <laughs> I, I love that part of his character. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Bullshit. <laughs> yeah i think it's like you know i i think that's the thing his vanity prevents him from just going with the flow riding out the universal uh kind of flow of his career so to speak and it keeps biting him in the ass because he says no i'm done with dracula then they say forget it we're gonna make dracula's daughter with uh karloff and you and whatever and it's gonna be a sequel to the stoker novel based on dracula's guest but then that falls through kind of partly because of his negotiating and it becomes Dracula's daughter again, which is its own masterpiece is the first like really lesbian vampire movie ever. And uh, then he comes back and he does uh, Mark of the Vampire for MGM. And uh, so he just keeps going back and forth. And if he says, I'm not going to play Frankenstein. And I'm sure someone knows a lot of people know he eventually does play Frankenstein, the monster. And I think Ghost of Frankenstein or House of Frank. Like, so he just keeps you know, fighting himself and screwing himself over while Karloff accepts it and he uses it all to give him roles in other movies. And it's really when he does House of Frankenstein way before that point that he realizes, okay, he's still doing all these like very nice, you know, more classic roles, you know. And uh, it's, it's really him realizing, okay, I got to change my strategy and use this to keep me changing it up. And that's how he becomes friends with Fal Luton at RKO when Val Luton is launching a whole series of very cheap, modestly budgeted horror pictures. And it's because that he does the body snatcher with Lugosi as his co-star, which is a very classic black and white horror film. It's a gothic. That changes everything for Karloff because he decides, I don't want to keep doing this. I'm going to do that. And uh, Lugosi, ironically, is his co-star. And Lugosi is incredible. The two of them are amazing in that. But he, you know, Lugosi, again, is just so egotistical where Karloff does that and basically says, I love working for Val Luton and RKO. And he keeps doing pictures with Val Luton and RKO that again, keep expanding him, showing them the world that he can do more than the typical monster. And well, that's and, why. And, and back again, at that time, like that was the shit. Like they were just, <laughs> they're like, look, we made monsters. Like, could you <laughs> imagine like, 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 you know, Lugosi's over there. Like, I don't want to put on teeth. And you know, Karloff's like, put me in full shit, whatever. <laughs> hey. you know, like, he was like the Doug Jones of that time. You know, like, yeah. ima imagine yeah. if Doug Jones was back then. He'd be like, yeah, I'm a fucking lizard. Whatever, put me in a thing. I, you know, <laughs> whatever his, his deal is. But uh, once again, think, Ellie, yeah, you're right, Aaron. That, that's a good point. You're right. Like, I mean, the, to to wrap up, I know we gotta move on, but you're right. Like. It is that point in our history, film history, culture, 1931. It's the monster craze. It's just yeah. beginning that. It's the first birth of taking these gothic supervillains and antiheroes that were created 100 years before and making them to movies. That's the phase. Like, whether it's MGM or it's Universal, Hunchback of Notre Dame was made MGM with Lon Chaney. That's what they're doing. So it's like, yeah, why would you fight that? Just keep doing that. 
It and was then huge. Doing I mean, your bit parts here and there, it's, we which see is these... what Karloff did. He knew to do bit parts in other movies while doing the monster stuff, where Lugosi kept saying, no, I'm not doing that, no, no, no. Like, he was just was too, <laughs> too much you, of a diva. You know, we see all the time those 100 pack of movies for like 20 bucks or whatever. <laughs> and they're all like, 1930s shit that stuff people were going to all of that it didn't matter what it was people went and watched white zombie and thought it was a good movie yeah. that that shit's boring as fuck if you try it to is, watch it, it nowadays <laughs> and that's the ghosty too right he's in that yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 boring as fuck but you know if you got a couple buddies there and you're chopping it up watching the movie you know you can have a good time with it and it's got a good mood to it so yeah. i i kind of get it but uh yeah, once again, I didn't know any of that shit. So thank you for teaching me every month a little no, bit no. more. Can uh, I say something real quick? Yeah, yeah whatever you want, man. My, my takeaway from it was this one thing that you said that caught me off guard, how people kept calling in and donating, trying to donate their organs. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> the actors in my life. But I've never said, hey, take my spleen. Take my spleen, right. Yeah, Especially yeah. about that reckless Tom Cruise. He'll take it. He, he's yeah. dangerous. <laughs> Right, he'll, he'll fuck shins, all your shit. Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's another so, time. It's another yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty crazy. Uh, Jay, did you have anything to say about that? Uh, I'm just gonna say it's so cool that both these movies happen at the same, you know, in the same time frame, and then we, you know, we can look at every Dracula, every Frankenstein movie after that. Those are, of course, direct influences. But look at all the monster movies: the Jason Voorhees, the all the uh, Freddy is very similar to Dracula. He comes and visits women in their sleep and yeah. you know, takes what he wants. So we have to look at <laughs> not just what they meant at that time, but what they meant to all of us throughout, you know, history that yeah. they yeah. really inspired everybody. Uh, so what, um, what's your, what's one of your favorite vampire films? Uh, uh, do you prefer Bella Lugosi or Christopher Lee? What's your favorite Dracula? Okay. My favorite Dracula <laughs> is Gary Oldman. I mean, oh, I, I'm, yeah, a 90, I'm a '90s kid, Gary Oldman. You, you know, except uh, for when he's got the the the, the, the heart wig, yeah, the bun, <laughs> the double buns. Uh, but yeah, he's my favorite. I mean, I I know that the uh, like I actually watched here a while back the, the Spanish version of Dracula that they did. Like they shot at night while they much were the same time. Yeah, much better. It is better, did, right? Did, did you guys know? Yeah. Did everybody know that that at the same time they were shooting the Bela Lugosi Dracula. They were also shooting a Spanish version of Dracula in the same sense. Mm, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So you can that's watch it and be like, that's the same, but different, but that's yeah, the same. It's the same. <laughs> they use the same sets. They use the same costumes and they yep. paid them very much less. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You know, a Dracula that I don't think gets much credit is uh, from the monster squad. The, I don't remember the actor's name. <laughs> Yeah. but seriously that's you know great like, movie though, yeah yeah he's he does a good job he's very it's kind of like the wish universal he's the yeah you know? exactly <laughs> like, he gets enough credit like he's like he Dra he's like job. he's like dracula he's, he's dracula. Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> wow well, all right yeah. uh, <laughs> but let's move in to lisa's segment now before we get into this you call your segment Goodnight Bunny and we've never addressed why. So I'd like oh. to to find out why. Yeah, okay, so um, <laughs> if that's an involved story. Okay, so it, I'll, I'll, so I work, uh, it's weird. How am I even gonna make this like tame and not seem like a psychopath? Oh my God. Well, y'all, you know I'm a psychopath. I know Elliot knows I'm a psychopath. I'm a, a kind-hearted one, but uh, I worked <laughs> with a guy <laughs> who, uh, a radio guy. So I work in media. Well, I did work in media before my you know fall from grace and whatnot, but I work in media in New Orleans. And I worked with a very notorious uh, guy who was basically, a lot of people said that, um, you know, Ron Burgundy from Anchorman, mm -hmm. they said yeah. that he was loosely based on him, you know, and yeah. now Adam McKay has said that, you know, he definitely influenced him, but he um, apparently uh, his wife killed herself, but he killed her. And everyone that I work with, everybody knows it. And her name was Bunny. So the night that, you know, and basically the reason that I'll tell you the whole story. So he uh, had his own radio show. And on a particular night, he had a sex therapist on and he had people calling in on, on one of these occasions. One of the people who called in is talking about, you know, her husband's lack of attention. He doesn't give her attention in the bedroom. And the sex therapist says, well, you need to talk to him. And she goes, well, you're looking right at him. He's the host. So oh, that night, oh, that no. night, she killed herself. And uh, basically, uh, when I first moved here, I was like really shocked because everyone I work with, everybody, it wasn't a question of like, did he do it? You know, they were like, good old Ron. He, of course he did it. You know, that's what happens in radio. Ha <laughs> ha. And I'm like, what the hell? And I'm like the only person that like had a problem with this. 
so she's been, you know, buried and gone, but like basically, yeah. So the last thing he ever said to her was good night, bunny. So that's why I call it good night, bunny. Yeah, because I'm dark and twisted and a sociopath. So. All right. <laughs> yeah. Now we have an amazing story. Yeah, right. I have so See, many amazing stories. Well, yeah. You live in probably the craziest part of the United States, I think. I do. Uh, New I really do. Is it, are you in New Orleans or is it? Just... I'm like 10 minutes outside the city. Yeah, you can good actually, Lord. from my balcony, you can actually see the tops of the building. It's really cool. And then yeah. on the other side, there's just gators and crawl dads. Yeah, <laughs> down the bayou. Down the bayou. I was actually just doing a TikTok talk about uh down the bayou mysteries and stuff like that so I yeah bet there are so we have rednecks and hillbillies around here but i bet that <laughs> they're you have different. the best the purest they're the fucking breed. straight out yeah. the still uh, <laughs> well the story I, I was just doing was about a uh, sheriff's deputy who like went on a rampage for no reason down the bayou so they say people just go crazy down the bayou you know but yeah so yeah long story long you know yeah right on well yeah, we're, right we're on. talking about uh <laughs> We're talking about uh, movies that were based on true events. Today. Right. And I have a really cool story with this. So like I was I was blowing you up telling you about this today. So a uh, decade ago, so long ago, I was in a bank and I'm sitting, you know, I'm standing in the line with this lady behind me. And across the way is one of those circular buildings and it's a Kinko's. But before that, it was a mattress store. And this lady, she says to me, oh, I haven't been here for like 10 years since my son and daughter-in-law ran that as a mattress store. Well, anyway, long story long, they were the couple from the movie Open Water. So oh, I was talking oh. to the mother of the son. Yeah, and she was explaining about how they had gone scuba diving. And, you know, of course, you know the infamous story. They go scuba diving and I guess they, you know, miscounted or something and they never go back for them. So they're adrift for hours and most likely got eaten by sharks or whatever so I was like in line with her and then years later they actually made a movie about it which was like so weird because I'm like I I've Man, it's, about- been a, it's been a long time since I saw that movie did they die oh, in that movie horrible. yeah yeah, yeah it's, it's a horrible, horrible movie it really yeah. happened too yeah. we all yeah. fell asleep I th- th- no I can't remember it they is, were were they just treading water did they have yeah, something they were so, holding on to yeah, yeah they it's literally they have their life vest on and they're afloat with life vests and uh i think um basically about a couple years ago somebody was uh, scuba diving in that area and they actually found uh their air tank with a message scrawled in it so they know they survived for quite a while but movies based on real stuff fascinate me and also piss me off greatly so like a great example um the strangers is apparently based off the ketty resort murders i don't know if you guys are familiar with that but i don't understand the parallels of how that movie's even based off the real life crime I because <laughs> i don't either i think they just tried to do it to sensationalize it and it pisses me off because the ketty resort murders are so fascinating within themselves uh also conjuring annabelle obvious ones you know, I don't know. Do you guys well, believe that? Doll? I think the that Warrens are War- the Warrens are yeah. carnies. Um, <laughs> that's just yeah, my I opinion. The Warrens. I, I anytime I, I see somebody I'm- like mixing it up, like doing that shit. Like, sure, if you're a ghost hunter, that's one thing. But if you're a person who's like had so many fucking encounters with supernatural shit that you have a fucking museum, I don't believe you. <laughs> I don't believe you. But you don't and, think that they bring a little bit of good to people by giving them peace by like, let's say these no. people are terrorized or haunted and by taking the thing away or blessing their home, they didn't give them some kind of peace. You are know, they like, charging you money think, for that service? I don't know. Did they? Do we know I think if they so. charge money? Well, I think so. There really? was just, I just They're saw this ironically it. <laughs> in Roswell, New Mexico. This When I went cross country, I was in a gym in Roswell, New Mexico when out of nowhere, the Amityville True Story crime uh, documentary came on and it said that yeah there's some some things that have come out the warrens with the family that lived there after the amityville massacre kind of were part of writing the amityville horror book kind of mixing the seance they actually did do with a lot of bullshit to um make the people that had fled the book like rich i don't know but there's definitely some weird stuff the warren that's what i i remember it was definitely related to amityville whatever right. i had heard uh it's been a while since i wa- I, I know it was uh, some fucking youtube well, video there's so who knows? also that infamous picture that they took of the ghost child i don't know if you guys have seen that yeah. but it's an yeah. infamous picture and they have not been able to discredit that or disprove it so i mean that picture is pretty spooky within itself it yeah. looks just like that kid that got uh, murdered but you and know that movie, the thing about funny. elliot mentions it because that was another movie on my list so yeah 100 percent amityville horror you know 
all of them, I think, are pretty good too. By the way, you know? I think that you yeah. know it's one of those things where I I, I want to believe in the existence of ghosts. <laughs> I watch ghost videos all the time. Some of them I, I think too. are real. Some of them I'm like, eh, whatever. So I think that if you're in the business of fucking uh, bamboozling people and using uh, supernatural <laughs> means to do it, you're gonna maybe run across the ghost kid here or there. I don't know. You know, that's just <laughs> that's just the way it goes. But I think that they really were opportunists who saw a, a thing they could, because previous to them doing this, they were literally carnies. So like, you know, they were doing um, the, the, the psychic readings and stuff. And that stuff really can be just straight up carnival bullshit. And, yeah. and, and, and uh, what's the doctor that was uh, disproving all those psychics? What's his name? James uh, Randy or something like that. What, what the fuck was it? Have you ever seen that? The guy no. Back in the day. About, yeah. Back he in the used to day, prove the psychics with the yeah. spoons and stuff like that. Yeah, he oh, had a wow. whole, he had a million dollar challenge. If anybody could prove him, they, they he would find out their specific skill set, what they claimed to do, and then he would say, "I will give you a million dollars if you can prove it in these circumstances," and he would set you know everything down. There was one guy that came really close to doing it using some sort of computer program or whatever, huh. um, but. It was, he did, he missed it. If you say you can speak to dead people, I've got a whole load of questions I would like to ask certain dead people, answers to which I already have. And the dead people, since they're dead, I don't believe they've got the answers any longer. But if you want to call them up and ask them the questions and come up with the right answer, hey, you could win the million dollars. Many people say they can read minds, they can predict the future, they can interpret dreams and such. Well, it all depends on the specific claim they make. All they have to do is say what they can do, under what circumstances, with what accuracy. And some people have taken literally years. One fella, a PhD in California, took four and a half years to answer those three questions. And finally, when we got ready to enter into tests with him of remote viewing, as he called it, and he actually gave courses in this at the university in California, uh, he suddenly changed his email address and his telephone number. We haven't been able to reach him since. Isn't that strange? I guess he doesn't need the million dollars. There's even a guy that was, uh, he disproved him. He was a guy that um, he would make pages move with his hands and shit. Who ended up being a pedophile or something, but he disproved oh, him shit. wrong on TV. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's crazy. That's crazy. Well, I, you know, nothing against carny folk because some of my people are carny folk. So, you know, my mom is a gypsy fortune teller, so I can't really oh, wow. say too much. Yeah. So, you know, my you people go. are kind of crazy gypsy folk my damn self so i can't say anything against them you know what I mean? we might have been right there with the warrens doing some swindling here and there i there don't go. know i don't know but yeah i kind of respect them because i feel like they tread in waters that people don't necessarily want to you know what i mean because like who wants to mess with paranormal anything because it's so misunderstood so you know, I say good for it, you know, do your thing. And if they get paid for it, yeah. so be it. You know what I mean? I just Shit. would, I'll, I'll trust the, the tattoo kid with a tattoo on his face on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cause he seems real scared when something happens. <laughs> so I'm going to go with that. I've, I've been begging for years for somebody to take me along. I've never had one paranormal experience my entire life. What? You need to come Not, to New Orleans then you need to I'm come really, here. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen. So I've, I've been telling people, I'm like, you know, show me like i would i'm with frank i'd love to see something that i can't explain i i watch these videos too on youtube and i'm like yeah that's horseshit <laughs> but know? some of them some of them yeah. are like that seems fucked up right well, i know it right because, now i've got yeah. we've got this right okay so they have this infamous murder here so i've got this great for you my friend since you want a paranormal experience uh they yeah. have this guy who um during katrina he went crazy and he chopped his girlfriend up and ate her he baked Ooh. her in the oven cooked her in the oven he ate her. He spray painted all this shit all over the apartment. And this is the creepy part. They were above the um, Voodoo Ritual Center on Rampart Street. Oh. So the it burns down mysteriously. But get this. So now you can go rent the place out and go stay the night in the apartment. And the original oven is there and the original mm -hmm. uh refrigerator i don't know why it wasn't taken into crime scene right? but you can go <laughs> and you can stay and you can have a paranormal experience i guess and all these will people they, they go leave wow. all kind of stuff there yeah will we're they going, let me make friend. a nice lasagna 
<laughs> he, used, he seasoned her legs. Isn't that gross? I can tell oh you that. It was, well, it was you don't want to eat them without seasoning. I mean, yeah. Come on now. Oh, yeah. He used yeah. peas and carrots. Y'all can look it up. Zach and Addie, look it oh, up. The so apartment. I mean, yeah. At least he was having a balanced meal. You know? Right? Exactly. Hey, you guys are going to mess positive. around. <laughs> You're going to mess around and give somebody an idea. Right, like, hey. exactly. <laughs> I but can murder a bunch of people here and turn it into a tourist attraction. Turn it into something, right, exactly. <laughs> but that's what we do here. But we and Aaron were also talking about, um, like, slasher movies, Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. And I was also going to say, so apparently Silence of the Lambs is also mm-hmm. loosely based on, you know, uh, taken from multiple serial killers. And I don't yeah. know why mm-hmm. I find that so fascinating and yet creepy. You know what I mean? Like, I oh, always well, wonder. You know, I have. Like, that the, the I, I did have time to look up some of this henry shit i'll tell you what that dude allegedly killed one person like really for real because yeah. they he 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 got arrested for having a handgun right like right <laughs> and then he just started admitting to all these murders and so did otis like otis got arrested for burning down a house that <laughs> he evidently didn't even burn down <laughs> uh, there was the i'm going to list off the things that they didn't cover in the movie that i found out about um because there was some crazy shit the first one is henry lost an eye at 10 uh yeah. due to an infection uh, that occurred w- w- after a fight with his brother so they didn't depict that whatsoever he had both his fucking eyes they both worked fine and he was <laughs> and he was michael michael rooker who at the time was kind of a handsome looking guy i think i mean I'm, I'm i think not, he is i'm yeah. not a gay dude but i mean that's the a straight truth i'm not right? gonna say that when i met him he flirted with me but you know I, he, he's handsome he had a beret <laughs> he yeah. flirted with you we know he flirted with you <laughs> of course he did. I was like, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but otis and henry in the movie um it says that they're old prison buddies or whatever Right. They met at a soup kitchen and allegedly developed a sexual Gross. relationship, which Gross. was not Gross. at all talked about. Um, I don't want to see that depicted, if you, though. If you've <laughs> seen the pictures of them in real life, they do kind of look like the characters in the movie. So just picture that. Uh, or just look it up and imagine it yourself. Right. What that would be like uh, <laughs> to see. But Otis claimed that uh, many of the alleged murders were performed in the name of a cult he called the Hands of Death, not mentioned in the movie at all um henry didn't kill otis at all they both died in prison otis died of cirrhosis uh he was yeah he was arrested following uh uh, an incident where he set a former lover george sonnenberg's house on fire so he wasn't even interested in women whatsoever seemingly but according to what uh i read henry was almost like for sure a pedophile because he got arrested for trying to abduct three young girls at one point um all the things that he got arrested for makes sense as like a for like a pedophile because he admitted to all these murders but i don't even know if they could because he would have had to drive 370 miles a day in this shitty ass little station wagon to accomplish all the things that he said he did within this time frame and but, law enforcement was more than willing to accept all these confessions oh, all yeah. across that, the country that right? was one of the things that was crazy was that th- this is one of the situations where they were basically feeding him all the information he needed for every single they would hand him the fucking police reports and shit they would hand him all this stuff so he would just admit to it otis even admitted to killing uh john walsh's son adam walsh and what? Henry backed him up. Yeah. And then John yeah. Walsh accepted that shit and said, at least we know who killed my son. But then the crazy thing I read was that it might have been fucking Dahmer because he was living right uh-uh. down the right down they the way. Actually he interviewed caught- Dahmer and he said that he did not do it yeah. and that his taste ran different. Like he was very upfront about it, like and very diplomatic and like, oh no, 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 I went much different because apparently yeah. he liked African American guys and like he yeah. would a little bit older. So He's like, like well, they well, even well, asked him, I'm hold not on a pedophile, minute, buddy. I have standards. <laughs> you know? yeah, like, yeah, right. Hold on, hold on. I might have been <laughs> eating them, but yeah. you know, yeah. I did take these genitals to work with me, but I don't <laughs> fuck kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, that was the so the same time that John Walsh, Adam, right? Adam was yeah. his son. It's the yeah. same time as the Dahmer killings are happening. And, yeah. The yeah. and it was right down the way. And they said they saw a vehicle at the mall that looked that was like, similar. And yeah. they also mm-hmm. said they saw a man that resembled Jeffrey Dahmer talking to him. 
So, what? Wow. Yeah, but, that's you know, a movie. That's more of an interesting movie to me. You know, I, but that wouldn't, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be weird to me if he did it and then wanted to cover it up because I've seen that in other cases where they did something awful to kids and they didn't want anybody to know about that shit, right. but they were fine right. with the yeah. women they killed or whatever. Yeah. Right. So, um, and Becky Otis's niece in the movie that Henry has like a relationship with, um, she was 14 in real life. Yeah. And, he, and it was really his niece though, right? It was, it really was his Otis's niece. niece, but she had, right. they said intellectual disability. So right. take that as you will. But um, yeah, there's a lot of movies based on him. There's uh, of course, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. There's I think that the whole thing with Henry Portrait of the Serial Killer was that when it first came out, I know for me, it was just shocking. I had never seen oh, anything. Yeah. Like that was my first decapitation scene. Like the part with him with the head. I was just like mm -hmm. floored. I had, and you know, I was way too young to be watching it, but that's always the fun of horror movies, right? So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's like forbidden and I'm like, oh my God, you know, it's I kept telling shocking. myself. It was I mean, totally shocking that, and you know, you have the really graphic rape scene, the home invasion scene. I know we've yeah. talked about that before, but that was just almost like, it's not even a real movie scene. Like it seems so authentic and mm -hmm. it's so gritty and gross. And uh, I thought the depiction of the bodies were very cleverly done at the beginning yeah. because they're taken from real crime scenes. Like you can literally Google the photos that that's based off of. And that's kind of sick and twisted, but also gives it that real element that I find genuinely scary. So yeah, yeah it works. See, I, it works I, for me. I saw yeah. that movie when I was uh, definitely an adult. I didn't see it when I was younger. Um, I was like 11. It, it, it was still jarring <laughs> as an adult to see him fumbling around with those body yeah. parts at the end. The noise yeah. that, oh, you know, yeah. when he yeah. lifts it up. Yeah, I, I like that almost fainted that away. Yeah. I think it was softened a little bit by me seeing uh, Michael Rooker in mall rats before I saw him in anything else. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah, oh, this is, this is like the pretzel guy. <laughs> yeah, the pretzel guy. Got the stink hand. But yeah. they, shot, they shot that in like 87, didn't they? And it took yeah. three years of, of like taking it around to the little yeah. rinky dink theaters and yeah. getting the X rating before anybody actually cared about it. Right. Right. And, right. Yeah. Yeah, Highly what a kept it for the alive. time. Yeah, such that a is, gross movie. <laughs> it's a ten like, out of ten, though. I mean, I saw oh, yeah, I'm yeah. And it's one that, like, if somebody hasn't seen it, I'm always like, you, you. I mean, I, I normally don't like to say you gotta see something, but you gotta see that. It's just as it, it's at that dark. time, 198, what 86? Is that when it was? Yeah, like 86 or 87. 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, uh, yeah, Premier but, Magazine. Yeah, I mean that shit is for that time period what what else was there that was that graphic i, I can't yeah. think of anything i mean maybe some wild ass cannibal movie or or some <laughs> shit like that but well, yeah what's funny is this movie comes out in 87 everybody sees it around 88 90 around there right and it gets mm -hmm. an x rating then two years or a year later we get silence of the lambs who clears house at the oscars you know, and here yeah. we're talking about a movie but actually based on Dr. Alfredo Bali Trevino, I believe, is the actual inspiration for Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. The guy that uh, Thomas Harris did an interview with when he was working for Rolling Stone magazine down in Mexico. And he was just like enthralled with this guy and he was started creating a character of Hannibal Lecter. But it's it's so funny because like, you know, just a year, you know, two years before they're looking at Henry like it's dirt and silence hits and it's art, high art, you know, you know. <laughs> Now, but do you think great. Silence of the Lambs would have done as well if it was as graphic as Henry? I mean, it would have been. I think so, because it's so beautifully, seamlessly done. You know what I mean? It's engaging yeah. and absorbing, you know? Yeah. I also think it's almost got pro-feministic elements, too. You know, as a girl, it was the first time I saw, like, a girl, like, kick ass and, like, you know, like, she was tough. And I like that. You know what I mean? I've always thought this the scene where she's explaining in the car ride to... Uh, you know, the higher up FBI agent. Yeah, exactly. Um, why it was important for him right. to not treat her like that in front of other people. It's important, it? sir. Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> that was great. Back, sir. That was great. <laughs> she nailed it. Yeah. Thank Classic. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do it great. I, I could like go into Clarice and do the whole, you know, character, like, you know, but yeah, yeah. I probably know every line. Yeah. But I, yeah, I love that movie. I think it's, uh, I think even if it got darker, sure, in that time period, it probably would have got a harder rating because it was already controversial when it came out you know yeah I mean, yeah. yeah i wasn't was, allowed to yeah. watch that one my parents didn't let me watch it for like i had to yeah. wait until i was like 15 or 16 to oh watch i that see shit. and yeah. my mom was so cool my mom's like this cool hippie chick and she's like i'm gonna smoke a joint we'll watch it together man and we did <laughs> <laughs> see there was it made no sense what they didn't let me watch because they didn't yeah. let me watch leprechaun and <laughs> silence of the lambs 
<laughs> but then my dad took me to the video store. I'd rent fucking Toxic Avenger and shit, which has uh, like Toxic Avengers crazy right. stuff. Yeah. In it. I mean, uh, yeah, First and he would I just saw that was on cover my eyes up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how my dad would deal with it. He would cover but, my eyes up and just fucking hold on. I remember watching <laughs> uh, Taxi Driver with my dad. My dad rented, I'm not even kidding, Taxi Driver. And I remember sitting there watching it with him and I was like 10. I was like, this oh, wow. is some dark shit right here. Yeah, I remember thinking <laughs> that was like the movie. darkest movie ever. And I loved it. I remember seeing De Niro just spiral out. And I was like, this is great. And also I was like, oh, De Niro was hot back in the day. Look at that, you know, but yeah, it's great. <laughs> yeah, like little 10 year old me was like, what the hell? You know, what kind of world are we living in? But yeah, I remember being like um, scandalized by Jodie Foster in that movie too. Cause she's super young. Like, isn't she like 14 when she filmed yeah, it? Yeah. She was yeah. yeah. So I was like 10 when I saw it. And I remember being like scandalized by her, like, you know, depiction of like, I guess, a you know, teen, you know, prostitute or whatever, prostitute. but yeah. You know what's yeah. weird? You remember what year was it? Whenever was it Hinkley that would try to kill Reagan for yeah, Jodie yeah. Foster? Like yeah. what year was that? 80, 81. I just read a whole, <laughs> I've been researching a bunch of scripts. Yeah. I just read a whole book. They, they were all connected. That's what's really disturbing. Like this oh, yeah. latest book talks about John Hinckley was trying to impress Jody Foster. Mark David Chapman actually talked to John Hinckley Jr. before he killed Lennon or vice versa. Wow. Like Crazy. really disturbing I just, stuff. Like I was just wondering like what movie he saw her in or what like what was under her belt as a superstar that made him be like, she's going to love me if I kill this. Like, what is the reason? <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like it's Taxi Friday, Driver, right? right? Was it Taxi Driver? Was she I think it girl? was. She was like a it's the plot of the movie, movie right? Or Taxi Driver. Wasn't it Contact? Oh, no, it I'm could be. A <laughs> you know what? That makes sense. If it's he saw the Taxi the Driver. Yeah, De Niro <laughs> has this weird, he's going to kill the politician. Yeah. 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 But then all of a sudden he has this, this shift where he's like, no, fuck this. I'm gonna go kill these pimps down the street because I don't like them. You know, it's fucking uh, awesome. Yeah. And then, it's cool. and then you know, the great part is the end because he's the hero. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Everyone thinks he's this great hero and nobody knows he was about to assassinate yeah. this dude. Right. Yeah. I wonder how many that had a lot to do with Hankley. I, I bet a lot of people saw that movie and took that the wrong way because <laughs> I watched it when I was a teenager, and if I had the wrong mindset, you know, that would have been. I, I, been like, I am him. I am him. <laughs> right. Right. Really twisted. <laughs> when I saw Taxi, I was in a dark place when I saw that movie, and I was like, "Wait a minute, this ending." Yeah. I'm like, "Yeah, the last shot yeah. of him looking in the mirror, you're like, he's a psychopath. Like he's he still nice. yeah. that ending, <laughs> but he could still do the wrong thing after he drops off. Uh, you know, what's your name?" Yeah, you know, when, uh, but turns down for the there day. is that when he shaves his fucking hair into the mohawk and he's <laughs> yeah, got the it's so is cool. it a gun that he yeah. has that comes yeah. out of his coat? Yeah, yeah it's it's I love that thing. I like when he's so burning his loves hand. Taxi Driver. He like yeah. does an homage to it in almost every yeah. one of his comedy projects. Oh really? Yeah, he loves Scorsese. His comedy says all comes from all Scorsese movies. <laughs> and what about the scene with Scorsese himself when he sits there and he's uh -huh. gonna kill his wife? That's so brilliant. Every time I see that, you know who's up there right now? My wife's up there. I love that scene. It's so yeah. well done. Yeah, <laughs> it's a great movie. Great movie. <laughs> I never found Jodie Foster that hot though. I'm people no. are gonna hate me for saying that, but like <laughs> I never understood like who was like who was so seduced I, by her that like oh my god I gotta go kill so like for Jodie Foster what? I gotta then, tell you. Know, you my dad did my dad really? always oh, wow. my dad was super mad when he found out that she was a lesbian he's like oh really? I, was like, <laughs> I was like hey you've been married for like 30 years anyways and uh i don't that's think like being shot. mad that she, ellen was a lesbian right yeah right. it's right. like it doesn't make sense yeah but, can you um, imagine how mad hinkley is I know, yeah. right? No <laughs> well, he just totally. got out of jail not too long ago. He's doing yeah. music now. So he's, he's got oh, some music um, out there. I believe if anyone oh. is a drummer or bass player, he's looking for someone to play with him. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, check oh, it out. Man. But um God, wanna... could you imagine being in his band, guys? Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> like <laughs> all, all right, all right, John, don't get mad. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Yeah. It's already a band called yeah. the killers uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice um so um i had something i wanted to bring up because i saw it this morning and it fucking fucked me up a little bit now i don't know who, ari Oster, aster how do you is that how you say his name uh yeah. what has yeah, he we, done um hereditary is that what hereditary he's known for and midsummer. Hereditary, midsummer okay you gotta go I, all the way back to the strange thing about the johnson that's what college. i was gonna talk yeah. about that's what i yeah. saw this morning it's like a half an hour <laughs> yeah, long it's <laughs> up. and uh if you haven't seen that um i don't know if you should watch it but i'm saying 
that it's really fucked up. <laughs> and it's like, up. it's like, why it is it? I'm lost. Why? Yeah, what is if it? I tell it's, you, if I tell you what YouTube. it is, help me and Randall out. We're lost. Is, we he, don't know. is this his first film or something? It's sure. his, yeah. it's his student first. film thesis yeah. or whatever. Okay. I'm gonna see. I'll see what the description says because I don't want to. I don't give need away. to watch it right now. I got enough. Don't, don't no. Don't I, give it away, <laughs> man. It's a, it's a slap in the it's, face. It's movie. really short. Correct. Um, I just watched Hereditary again. It's a masterpiece, but it's so hardcore. I I know, had so no hardcore. interest in seeing it. That's why I don't. Know oh, it's incredible. Um, it's really well done. Yeah. yeah. Th- yeah. This thing. Why not, uh, Aaron? You don't like it. It's not my. <laughs> what do you have against Lisa, Tony Collette? What's wrong Lisa, with you? Nothing. Not, <laughs> Lisa. He's incredible. Incredible. Lisa, yeah. I want, to, I want you to take a look back on our history on this podcast together. <laughs> um, what do I like? You like splatter, gore, zombies, monsters, I like, creatures. Yeah. yeah. Dumpster <laughs> fires. And is there anything in Hereditary <laughs> that's not slow burn bullshit? Because I don't want that. No, it, it, it actually, it, it had, I think you might like it. Cause I it, think it you does might too. Yeah. Like, okay. Now, if, if the, got whole, a bit of both. There's if, a lot of if Sam the Raimi shock of I, seeing I, a girl smash her face. Raimi on a pole is the is the thing i'm like oh i already know that happens and i've already seen no, it. the rest of it so is it like if it's like is it like knowing that nothing happens in blair witch like when you go no. to watch it like <laughs> i no. don't know no it's like it's, 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 like executed. Yeah. it's, it's one of those things where i know just based on the prestige that it carries with it that i don't like it like it's no. just <laughs> it's like yeah. if it does, if it's not straight to video it's not my <laughs> wheelhouse really i mean i don't give a fuck about big production artistic artisanal movies it i want microwave massacre i want street trash <laughs> i want garbage so it's got the like, garbage I, aspect though i'm telling like uh, it, it looks too shiny and smooth elliot <laughs> you're right frank you're not gonna like people, it don't watch it okay would, would it be <laughs> Would it be in contention for maybe winning an award? I'm telling you, it's got acting. <laughs> for me, I loved it because it has the last mm. half hour is bonker shit, Sam Raimi crazy. Yeah. And then the rest of it is a mixture between Lars von Trier and like William Freak and the Exorcist. What, so it's not boring. See, I, 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 and that's, uh, I don't that. know what Lars von Trier has done, but I don't like the Exorcist. So, <laughs> like, Our like my opinion on the podcast is total shit. Like, I don't even know why I do it because it doesn't matter. No one likes my opinion. It's not a good one, but it's mine. So I feel it's an added value to the podcast to have a shitty opinion that might represent like a third of the third of people that listen to us or whatever. Yeah, there's that. There's that one out of ten people that listen to us that are like. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. You've never seen Antichrist? Who's seen Antichrist? Oh, I've Antichrist. tried to watch Antichrist. I, oh I my god! <laughs> but you know, like possession from eighty one. For me, I want to have fun. So if there's no fun, <laughs> I don't want to watch it. <laughs> now, I'm, not, I'm, I'm living in a constant state of depression. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, what do I want to pop on? Like Antichrist? <laughs> no. Yeah. I turned Antichrist it right takes off. me out of my life. It, it makes oh, like me forget. A, like I'm like, all right, at least I don't have boxes want, talking me, to me while my girlfriend's like, trying to kill me. Like, yeah, you it's get, like you, a, there's a checklist you can know if I like a movie or not. Are there dumbass clowns in it? Is but, there an idiot that makes annoying but, jokes the whole time and then gets uh, killed in a fantastic splattery way? I, I mean, get, that he's about I, it. <laughs> I get what you're saying, but like, it's like this, Frank. Like, I'm in unlucky in love, but I, I don't shun all romantic comedies. You know? I, I don't like those either, Randy. I, have, I am 40. I have like 20 years left. Why would I waste my time? You know, uh, I watch shows. Right. I, I watch movies I don't like for this podcast all the fucking yeah, time. Me, me <laughs> too, <laughs> brother. I, I just, you know, I stick to what I like. I watch Perfect Strangers. I fucking <laughs> watch Night Court, and then I he call does. it a day. You know, yeah. so um, well, you know, wonderful shows. <laughs> off subject, sorry. Stitches. If you, Stitches, the clown. This is a horror movie, right? Did you guys? Uh, what? What's? Is this a good movie? I keep seeing it. On I haven't seen that thing. one. Yeah, it's I Ross Noble, that one Noble yeah. the uh, English comedian Ross Noble. He was on one of the Celebrity Big Brothers, is what I remember him. But uh, it's, I, it's, it is what it is. It's Irish uh, comedy, so it's a little different than ours. It's a little like in your face, like you know, yeah. really gross. But okay. it's funny. He does great in the in the uh, the title role of Stitches the, yeah, okay. the Clown. I might, I might like that. I mean, I like. See, that's right. I thought Aaron, you know that. What's yeah. what's that other? Um, I like that other shitty clown. What is it? Uh, the the the. Uh, what is it? It's Full Moon. 
Um, there's oh, like three or four anything. of them. Um, Shakes the Clown. Killjoy? Shakes the Clown. That's a great movie. Killjoy. <laughs> the Killjoy movies. All of them. I like all of yeah, them. Yeah, the they're wonderful. Uh, Killjoy Goes to Hell. Killjoy, whatever oh, wow. the fuck. So, you know, send Killjoy somewhere. I'm there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm like, I. I hate that I have the opinions I do, but if I don't, if I'm not honest, what the fuck good's the podcast? You know, we're not going to have a back and forth. There's, there, if we all just sat around sucking each other's dicks, what the hell? <laughs> fun would it be? You know, well, like, I'd just be lost. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody said anything about that. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, um, we do like some, there's a lot of crossover there. I don't, I, I don't totally shun everything that's like, <laughs> top notch i mean what uh what's that movie uh, i just watched last year or whatever uh god uh, god damn it i can't think of nothing <laughs> it's uh about oh what's it's got that jesse whatever his name is in it uh Plums? eisenberg uh, um oh vivarium yeah. vivarium wait is that it? yeah yeah, oh, yeah. Vivarium, was it good yeah. did you like it I, that's a shiny ass fuck uh, that should win an award from my opinion it's yeah. like yeah, a good. it's like a science fiction type of thing they See, and I just wasted my time watching the one with those two stupid girls that climbed the tower. That was so dumb. Oh, oh my god. god. That. that was yeah. so dumb. It was Is so that? dumb. Yeah. It should just be called stupid white girls that do stupid white girl things because it's so dumb. They're like, let's just climb the cell phone that, tower. That's the cell phone yeah, tower. Yeah. And, and all these kids were like, it. it's so scary. And I'm like, it is not scary at all. It was so dumb. And usually I like movies where like they're in weird, impossible scenarios. Like we're in a, you know, cage and we're gonna go shark diving and the thing breaks and we're at the bottom of the ocean. You know, like I like things like that you know but this one was just it was effing stupid and it pissed me off so by the end of it i just wanted both of them to die and i was ready to <laughs> throw them off myself so yeah and see that's the thing like i don't like horror movies like that but i will watch them you know what i mean so i get what you're saying they're not my favorite but i will indulge and, every and once I don't, in a while you know? i don't like total trash because we've watched some movies on this fucking podcast that were below my barometer <laughs> like uh like uh titanic 666 terrible oh, yeah. i remember i didn't know you at that i saw your post before oh, i knew who you were and I was what like, about scarecrows scarecrows, scarecrows was, awesome. was all right i mean it was like, awesome i loved scarecrows I, like, I thought scarecrows was awesome it could have been awesome really all really really awesome if they would have slapsticked it up and put a lot more blood all over right the place. <laughs> we know? need to make a remake <laughs> yeah um but you know everybody's got different tastes um does anybody else have anything else they want to well, discuss? I just want to say, Frank, though, when the thing I like, though, about your opinions are they're so different than mine that when we do agree on something, it's almost orgasmic. <laughs> <laughs> it like, happens yes. a lot more than I think that. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you look at like the approved movies that we've watched, like Evil Speak, that is right in my fucking wheelhouse. That's a great ass movie. <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm surprised you like that. I mean, I love because, it. <laughs> because it's like such that level of perfect schlocky cheese for me that like you know and uh ticks that's perfect. Ticks. <laughs> and, you know and that's yeah. why i think that if you haven't seen mosquito you should check that out because that's i'm gonna check it out it goes right there yeah. with it man i, I have watched, ticks uh, on 4k sorry wait ahead, uh i watched the one with the killer rats from the 80s it was so horrible it's oh, yeah. like the rats they kill but li like why couldn't i turn away from it i loved it it was <laughs> so bad it was so bad <laughs> the funny thing is how they use real rats in it so like they just like blew them up so you'd have these scenes with the real actor rats, I guess, you know, but anyway, nice. yeah, it's so hard. I see. I love yeah. movies like that. I love the old. Me too. Uh, me 50s too. They're funny them. and lost in. Yeah. Remember them, the giant. Oh them is God. the best. Yeah. I, I love them. That is yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. Them is yeah. incredible. Yeah. That's and one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> What's Remember your favorite? Night of the Lupus with uh, yes. the Guardians. Night of the Lupus. Yeah, yeah. The the giant, giant of the giant lupus. bunnies. <laughs> yeah, giant bunnies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, want, lupus. I want that. I don't want the pretentious like William remake with Crispin Glover. I want like the dirty, silly, sick. Like you I said, like I that? do love that schlocky side to it. Like I don't want it to be all seriously redone. Oh, Chris, Crispin Glover is such a fucking weirdo. That oh, I, I, I met love. him. He's amazing. Have I you seen the movies? movies. He he did a couple movies where he cast it exclusively with down syndrome people. That's what I saw. I went to Phil, uh, Phil Pittsburgh to see them in person. Oh, they're so oh, wow. bizarre. They're, they're so incredible. bizarre. They're insane. I can't remember what they're called, but if you look up Crispin Glover. The big film, question, what is it? Is one uh, of them. Oh, yeah. Big question, what is, and then the other one's called like everything. I saw them both. I they're like noir, today. right? It's like they're bizarre, but they're yeah. amazing. They're just Imagine bizarre. like a gangster movie where it's just all down syndrome people. Like that's mm -hmm. what I saw. 
I mean, it's a mixture of like that and 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 David Lynch even more yeah. further oh, out yeah. than David Lynch meets a horror movie. It's they're amazing movies. And they're he has Crispin Glover has music also, which is yeah, I have that album. <laughs> bizarre. Yeah, yeah. I have that album, Mr. Clowny Clown. Yeah, he is a nut. He is a nut. Love him. Yeah, but you know, anyways. Um, I think that's a show, guys. Uh, yeah. um, make sure you go and get the book that we uh, wrote, right, Ray? Um, oh, yeah, uh, right. The Midnight Nexus Volume 2 is available now. It dropped early. Wow. So it's a, it's all um, short stories, but they're done in a, like, it's more horror geared for the Halloween season, so that's why that's we dropped so cool. it. That's so cool. Uh, Frank uh, contributed two stories. I have five. Wow. Another wow. author has five, and another author has one, so... We, it's it's uh, clocking in hardbacks 196 pages, paperbacks 236, I think, and and it's on Kindle, so yeah, for like three bucks or whatever. Yeah, three. And bucks it's or... all it's it's all porn that you guys came up with now. Is that what yeah? You're I just drew a big <laughs> picture. All, yeah. I just I drew a yeah. big picture of a dick on on the page. Well, my, <laughs> there you go. Hey, if it sells, right? My my first story in it is called "Games Lovers Play." It about is a, it is erotic. What happens? Oh, yeah, wow. it's an erotic yeah. or. So. <laughs> oh i like that that's one of my favorites oh my goodness i would like it yeah it's, it's basically yeah. a big setup for a joke at the end which which i think is funny so but i it's, love uh, that yeah, yeah that's great yep well so, uh but yeah they're they're all for sale on amazon.com yeah, Wait, the mid sorry. Yeah. Where, Elisa, are you drinking blood? Did you just come out as a vampire? I saw you sit from like a goblet of blood. <laughs> talking about clowns. <laughs> what the heck? Oh, oh, oh it looks like blood. I'm like, this is it. She finally, re- she's a vampire in New Orleans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, um, maybe next time. Maybe next time. <laughs> make sure you follow Lisa on TikTok. Yeah. She's blowing it up over there. Oh, yeah. blowing I'm it trying. Up. And, uh, Lisa, what's your last name again? Uh, Lumine, Lumine. Yeah, I just See? got in trouble for uh, community guidelines for a uh, lawnmower man. Oops. Oh, no. Yeah. Did so, you appeal it? Because if you appeal it. I oh. did. I did. I think it's because I used the word porn. So yeah, probably. I guess you yep. can't. Yeah, really? so, wow. yeah, I'm learning these things. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, they got, it does it. you know, I was they like, get, oops. They get really weird about some of it. It's, it's yeah. I, can't, I still can't figure it all out. Yeah, it's so bizarre. So, yeah. yeah. You know. But, uh, uh, make sure you, you you subscribe to Jay's channel, Jay versus Horror, yes. on YouTube. Nice meeting you, Jay. Yeah, nice nice meeting you. Me, yes, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Cool. All right, thanks, guys. Had fun. I'll see you. you. Too. Right. See you thanks, later, guys. guys. So I guess